This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, and this is Solve It for Kids, the podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now please welcome to the show my podcast partner, Galactic Space Geek, Jeff Ganya. Hello, Jennifer, and hello, listeners. We have got an episode that is going to make you love life and love everything about your hobby one year at a time because our guest has done something really big. Yes, he has. So what problem are we solving today? How do you count penguins? How do you count penguins? I don't know exactly what he does, but this job I want to have. Who is our guest today, Jeff? Our guest today is the very cool Noah Stricker, and he is a writer, photographer, and self-professed bird man who is based in Oregon who has also had the biggest year in the world. Oh, welcome to the show, Noah. Hey, thank you. Thank you. It's fun to be here. Oh, well, I am so excited because we're going to talk about one of my favorite animals in the whole wide world, penguins. Yay. (laughs) So we like to start out, though, instead of starting with the penguins, but have you, like, how did you get where you are now? Were you that kid who loved birds? and study them? Or did you just decide later on in life, hey, I just want to, you know, go look for some birds? Oh, well, when I was in fifth grade in elementary school, my teacher put a bird feeder on our classroom window. So I was, I don't know, like 12 Uh, years old, more or less. And she would stop class every time a new bird showed up outside. And we'd all try to identify it. And we had a little backyard birds poster all next to the window and we had evening grosbeaks and purple finches and american goldfinches and black tap chickadees coming right up and Jeez. i just thought it was super cool yeah so, yeah i got hooked and things have kind of escalated from there <laughs> <laughs> what a great way to start yeah. that story with the fact that your teacher would stop class every time there was a new bird there that's awesome as a as a student you must have loved that I thought it was really neat. It was a clear plastic bird feeder with a suction cup so it could go right on the outside of the window and you could right. stand inside with your nose about two inches away because the birds, <laughs> so you didn't need like binoculars or anything fancy. They would just come right up. Oh, that's so Brilliant. fun. That's so fun. So do you, rem- I mean, you started naming some, but I mean, do you have a favorite bird that your classroom, like maybe one that came back all the time or something like that? Well, that spring, I remember we had a birdhouse building project on our school just outside of town. So we had some open areas and we really wanted to get a Western bluebird to nest in one of the birdhouses. We didn't do it at school. We had swallows and wrens and some other birds. But I went home and I told my dad, Dad, we have to build some birdhouses. (laughs) And he was kind of, oh, okay, other side project. And we got bluebirds nesting in our yard. So for the rest of the school year, I just lorded that all over the <laughs> my class that we had bluebirds at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's awesome. <laughs> That's excellent. And it sounds just like a 12-year-old kid. Yes. <laughs> so from there, obviously, you're still in elementary school. Was this a life? Obviously, you can't just middle school and high school. Okay, I want to learn about birds in every class. <laughs> you can't just jump to that. What took you from there? Yeah, then I really got into it on my own, trying to identify the birds in our own backyard. And and then finally started meeting some local bird watchers in wow, Eugene. Okay. Um, they, you know, many birders are older of retirement age and They would love to find this kid who was interested. So they took me wing, so to speak, and took me on field trips and took me to their bird club meetings once a month. And that's how I really got into the community of birders. And then it was great because I had all these mentors who could show me the way. 
Yeah. I mean, and that makes it so much fun because when you find something, then you have someone who's excited about what you are, you know, the same thing you are to share it with instead of them like, oh, great. You saw a bird, right? Like, no, you (laughs) want, oh, awesome. You saw this bird that's so hard to find, right? Yeah. Some of the other kids in my class were not quite as interested in birds as I was. (laughs) But it was pretty cool the people who totally were. And so, you know, after school, I'd take off and go down to the local sewage ponds and look for ducks. And (laughs) Okay. So right now I am loving how funny this story is, but I'm thinking the lesson that a lot of our listeners could be pulling of it doesn't matter what you're into. If you are that into it, you will find your people and you can be into it together. Yes, I agree. Yeah, and eventually found other people who are closer to my age who are also interested in birds and hiking and all the things I like to do. And especially, you know, when I got to high school and college, it, it just, it was something I always loved to do just personally. And I never thought of it as like a career path or anything like that. And <laughs> right, look where it's got me. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask an actual question this time on, Do you think that growing up in Eugene, Oregon helped this because Oregon has more birds than other places? So you could see a lot more variety? I mean, yeah, Oregon is a good place for birding. It has the sixth highest bird list of any of the 50 states. So it's a pretty diverse state. Okay, there are birds no matter where you are in the whole entire world. (laughs) hundreds of miles from land in the middle of the ocean that live there. There are birds that fly over the top of Mount Everest. There are birds even in Antarctica, which I'm sure we'll get to in a second. (laughs) Yeah. It doesn't really matter who you are or where you're from. I think that's one of the coolest things about getting into birds is that really anyone can become fascinated by them. Oh, absolutely. So yes, that was a great segue. I was going to say, how did you get from fifth grade birder to going to Antarctica and studying or working with penguins and counting them or whatever you did down there? Tell us about that. Well, I started to do biology internships around high school and volunteering for wildlife refuges and learning how to mist net and ban birds on scientific projects and helping out graduates scientists who are working on this stuff. And so by the time I got to college, I had some experience under my belt. And when I graduated undergraduate with my degree in wildlife science, the first job I got right out of college was to fly to Antarctica on a U.S. Air Force cargo jet, land on the ice runway at McMurdo Station, get put on a helicopter with two other researchers and get dropped off at a remote field camp 70 miles away next to a colony of 300,000 penguins where we were <gasps> tents on ice in 20 below zero for the next two and a half months with no shower, no fresh food, just studying penguins all day for the entire summer. Oh my gosh. I mean, cool and also a little horrifying as in like being on the cold for that. I don't know that I could be that cold for that long. 300,000 penguins? Yeah. Plus or minus. I mean, they are sort of hard to count sometimes, but yeah, (laughs) we have mostly the little black and white ones that are about two feet tall that are called Adeli penguins. Mm -hmm. We also do emperor penguins nearby, which are the ones in like March of the Penguins or the movie Happy Feet. Those are emperors. They were Adeli Happy Feet too. They were the ones with all the energy and the Latino accents. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Excellent way to to help our listeners figure out which ones were which. (laughs) So let me ask the duress question. How do you count 300,000 <laughs> plus or minus penguins? Well, there are a few different ways you can count penguins. And I've been at this more recently when I went to graduate school. I studied a different kind of penguin called the chinstrap penguin in Antarctica mm-hmm. okay. for my master's degree. And the traditional way is you go into the penguin colony on the ground and you find a place like up on a rock or some viewpoint where you can see a lot of the colony at once. And then you start at one end and you go, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Seriously? Like, but how do you know, like, I, they move around. How do you know you aren't counting them twice? Well, when scientists study penguin colonies, we're interested not really in the total number of penguins, but actually in the number of nests. So the nests don't move, which makes things a little bit easier. And that's because the nests are the ones that are going to make it to the next generation. And so 
they're the population that really matters in terms of, you know, how many penguins there's going to be in the future. Each penguin makes a nest that has one or two eggs. Mm. Usually they gather some pebbles together on the ground and they lay their eggs and then they protect them and they They have a very small territory that's within pecking distance of their nearest neighbor. (laughs) So they're all packed in this dense colony. And it's interesting to know how many penguins there are from one year to the next because it helps us learn about how much food there is for the penguins out there in the ocean, which is actually kind of hard to study directly and how the ecosystem is doing and that kind of thing. So there has been quite a bit of effort over the past several decades just to count how many penguins there are from one year to the next. And that means someone's got to go down there to Antarctica count them all. Sit on the rock and be really cold and count all the penguins. (laughs) But for my master's degree, we also had some other technology. So we brought a drone with us. You know oh. that flat air camera that you can take pictures looking down on the penguin colony high enough that you're not bothering the birds. And that was very useful because then you can make a high resolution image of the whole penguin colony and then take it back home and count how many nests there are very carefully on a computer screen <laughs> or you know, assign an undergraduate student to do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was also a very useful way to count them. And then finally, the really cool thing I think is now there are computer algorithms like artificial intelligence Uh, system mm. you can program. So we trained an AI algorithm so that a computer could look at a picture taken from a drone of a penguin colony and automatically count how many nests were in that picture without us having to do it one by one, which takes hours and hours. That I think is pretty cool. And maybe like the future of censusing penguin colonies is you can just go there, put a drone in the air, take a photo, and then use a computer algorithm to count how many nests are in the photo. Wow. That is very cool. And you kind of answered my question as soon as you mentioned the drones, and you talked about wanting to know how many nests for how many penguins in the future, like how do you see the study of penguins moving forward? And I think you just started touching on it, but like, is the penguin population growing right now? Is it shrinking right now? And what needs to be studied more in the future? Well, there are 18 different kinds of penguins in the world. And only two of them actually live in Antarctica. There are penguins in South America and the Galapagos Islands and South Africa. There's a great Netflix TV show called Penguin Town about a colony of African penguins that lived in people's houses that you should totally watch if you get a chance. Oh, my gosh. I'm writing (laughs) that down. They live in people's houses? (laughs) (laughs) They're missing out on a big Airbnb opportunity right there. (laughs) So there are penguins in other places, but the ones in Antarctica are in a pretty simplified food web. So in the ocean, you've got phytoplankton, which is the basic, you know, like algae-like things that live in the water and live on sun. And then you've got the zooplankton, the little animals in the water that eat the phytoplankton. And mainly in Antarctica, that consists of krill, which is this little like like organism and krill is what almost everything else in Antarctica eats. The whales, Mm. eels, all the other animals Mm. there, and even the penguins eat almost entirely krill all summer long. So by studying how many penguins there are, you can get an idea actually of how much krill there is in the ocean, even though it's very hard to like study the entire ocean and count all the krill, you can count the penguins and that tells you how much food there is out there. And then that tells you how the ecosystem is doing and how it might be changing over time. Okay. So the next thing is like, what does that tell you if the food supply is high? What does that tell you versus if it's low? And what does that tell you about the ecosystem? What's really interesting right now in Antarctica is that the temperature has warmed up a lot since about the 1950s. It's different parts of the world, how much it's been affected, but the Antarctic Peninsula has actually warmed up by about nine degrees Fahrenheit since 1950, years. A lot of the ice there, well, has been melting and not forming. 
And so there's less sea ice than there used to be. And the krill lives under the sea ice. And so if you can link the like, decline in krill with the decline in the sea ice, you can start to put all the pieces together and understand oh. how the whole ecosystem is working. And that's kind of what we've been seeing. In fact, the chin strap penguin which is very cute. It has this line under its throat and it's black and white. Uh They seem to be declining while another penguin called the Gen 2 penguin, which looks different. It has a red beak, like it's wearing lipstick or something. And these white (laughs) spots on the side wearing earmuffs on its ears. (laughs) That one usually lives farther north and has been coming south and they're colonizing the area. They're actually doing very well right now. Oh, okay. So... One thing that kind of got lost for me was, have you been to Antarctica more than once to do this work? I think I've been to Antarctica now about 35 times. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. So after that, <laughs> I'm after going back almost every season since then. In fact, I just got back in February a few weeks ago from another three months in Antarctica on wow. a couple of different projects. So yeah, I think I in my veins at this point. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't know if I've ever talked to anybody that's been to Antarctica that many times before. Yeah. <laughs> so having been there that much and having studied the penguins that much, what would, I'm sort of thinking bigger and broader right now. We have listeners all the way from kids to their parents listening with us. What would you want to share as a big picture about what you would want us to know more about with penguins? I would say you will see news stories that will have very dramatic headlines about penguins are disappearing from Antarctica and they're all in decline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is true in some cases. There are big declines in some species of penguins, but you can't really generalize to all of them because some other ones are actually doing very well. So really the key takeaway right now is just that Conditions in Antarctica are changing very rapidly these days. That is definitely true in many ways. And so penguins, just depending on what that particular kind of penguin eats and how it lives, they're rebalancing. And Mm. those going up and down really reflect how there's just this amazing change happening in one of the most pristine parts of the world. So I want to actually ask you about what it's like to be in Antarctica. Like, you know, yes, you're seeing the penguins, but can you describe the, you know, what else you're seeing? The ice, the glaciers. What's it like? I still vividly remember the first time I ever landed on the ice. We took a plane and we landed on the frozen surface of the ocean because it's so cold there. The ocean freezes about 15 feet thick during the winter and in the spring. You can land a cargo jet on top of it. No problem. I got off and looked around outside and all I could see in every direction was this white, flat plane (laughs) going to the horizon in every direction. It was surreal. It was like landing on the moon or something like that. Wow. So bleak and desolate and barren. But at the same time, it's full of life. People think of Antarctica as this desert that has nothing down there. Like, why would you ever want Right. In fact, it has some of the most amazing wildlife spectacles anywhere in the world. Not just penguin colonies, but there are thousands and thousands of whales that migrate the ocean just off of Antarctica each year so that they can eat krill all summer long. And seals and other seabirds and just in this landscape of massive glaciers and rock and ice, it is like no place you will ever travel on Earth. I mean, just looking at the pictures that I've seen, you just go, wow. I mean, yes, it does feel like it's a different place, right? Than on the earth or whatever. How cool. And so people who are looking for meteorites from outer space go to Antarctica to find them. Because if you find a rock in those places, it must be from outer space. I just think that is so cool. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. And hopefully you can see that dark rock in that whole sea of white that you were just describing. (laughs) So as a birder, you know, obviously we all know that penguins live at the South Pole in Antarctica. How many other species of bird have you encountered in Antarctica? In Antarctica, there are not that many species of birds. I generally define Antarctica 
as anything south of 60 degrees latitude below the equator, obviously. And yeah. in that region, I think I've seen now in all my travels down there, 32 species of birds. Mm, <laughs> so wow. there are a few besides penguins. There's one called the snowy sheath bill, which is like this white chicken-like bird that walks around mostly in penguin colonies and lives by eating penguin guano. Penguin poop is its main part of its diet. <laughs> so that's okay. an interesting. <laughs> there is a bird called the Antarctic cormorant that's black and white. It looks kind of like a penguin, but it can fly. And there are wow. albatross there too, especially on the ocean crossing when you're approaching Antarctica. I have many times taken ships from Argentina across the Drake Passage, one of the most rough ocean crossings anywhere in the world, to get to the Antarctic Peninsula. And while you're going south on the ship, there are constantly albatrosses flying around you. Wow. And the biggest wingspan of any bird in the world. The wandering albatross has a wingspan that's about 11 and a half feet from wingtip to wingtip. Oh, th I didn't realize the wingtip was that big. So besides penguins, as Jeff said, you are also a birder. So tell us about your big year of birding and everything you've been doing aside from studying penguins. This was always a dream of mine. So for a birder, a big year is when you try to find as many species of birds as possible in uh -huh. one between January 1st and December 31st. And people have done big years many times before on all kinds of different scales. So you could do a big year in your own neighborhood. You could do a big year in your own city. You could do a big year in your home county, your home state. If you're really crazy, you might do it on a whole continent. And <laughs> I don't know if you've seen, there was a Hollywood movie in 2011 called The Big Year with Jack Black, Owen Wilson, and Steve Martin playing bird watchers. That was yes. a big story of three guys who did a big year in North America one year. Well, I always dreamed of doing a big year on the ultimate scale, which would be the entire world, which no one had ever really done properly before, I thought. And there are 10,000 800 species of birds in the world or so wow. and no one's ever even seen half of them in a year so wow. that's what I do in 2015 i decided i was going to try to see at least 5,000 species of birds in one year and <laughs> did you <laughs> i was gonna say Jen, you gotta ask the question <laughs> <laughs> yes so i spent the whole year traveling i went to 41 different countries in one year wow. I went to all seven continents. I spent every single day for 365 straight days traveling from one country to the next. And I ended up going way past my own goal. And I found 6,042 species of birds that year, smashing any existing world record before then. But really, the secret to success of the whole thing was that birding has become popular all over the world, even just in the past 10 or 20 years. Yeah, because Again, it's something that you can do anywhere, no matter where you live, there are birds around and there are birders all around the world these days. And so I was able to call them up in all the places I wanted to go and say, hey, I'm doing a big year. Can I come stay at your house and sleep on your couch for a few days? <laughs> so yeah, it was a year of seeing birds, but it was also a year of meeting all my fellow bird nerds of the world. And that ah. was so really fun. <laughs> oh, that is fun. I mean, excellent. Yeah. Wow. And I know it was obviously years ago at this point, but huge congratulations. Yes. And not just for hitting the number, but for setting that target and actually going after it. So many people, whether it's kids or grownups, they have an idea, but then they don't do enough to actually make it into a reality. That is, man, that's inspiring. I got to ask, are there one or two favorite stories from that year? about catching a glimpse of a bird somewhere you weren't expecting or mm -hmm. somewhere exotic? Well, one of my most wanted birds that year was one called the harpy eagle. I don't know if you've ever heard of a harpy eagle. It lives in mm, remote not. in South and Central America. It's the biggest raptor, the biggest bird of prey in the ah. West. It's several feet tall. It looks amazing. It has this huge crest on top of its head and its talons, if it spreads them out, it's about as big around as a dinner plate. Its legs are about as thick as adult human wrist. Wow. So it's a massive bird and it flies around the jungle eating monkeys and sloths as its main diet. Oh it, my gosh. Uh, ah. and 
takes them back to its nest, which is like the size of a bus up in the top of a tree. But harpy eagles are rather rare because they need a lot of territory to fly around in. Yeah. So they only exist in places that are relatively undisturbed. And when I got to central Brazil, I met a birder there who picked me up from the airport one evening. And when he picked me up, he said, we have an active harpy eagle nest that we staked out. And we're going to go there at four o'clock in the morning tomorrow and wait for the harpy eagle to come in because we know it's there. And I was so excited that he could, he never should have told me that because I could not sleep at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I got up again at 4 a.m. and we went out to the spot and found the nest. And we had to wait actually for about six hours, as it turned out for the eagle to fly in from its hunting trip that morning. And it finally okay. swooped right over our heads and <gasps> landed on a branch right in front of us with a half of a kawadi, this kind of raccoon-like animal of South America. Yes. And it, it sat there and just ripped apart this kawadi on the branch in front of us for the next hour. It was glorious. It was just the coolest <sighs> bird experience. I mean, oh, the hard wow. people is just a mythological creature, just about, but they really do exist. And I was amazed to be able to see one. That is so awesome. I thought you and were going to have a cool story. That was, that was beyond yeah, cool. But to have it swoop right over and land kind of right where you guys could see it. I, I bet you have amazing pictures and video perhaps of all of that. Oh yeah. You should look it up though. Harpy, H-A-R-P-Y, eagle. They are just a spectacular animal. Oh my wow. gosh. So you also have written a book about this adventure. And so can you talk to us about that? Yeah, that's what made it all possible for me. I'm not like super rich or anything. And <laughs> I buy plane tickets and stuff to get around the world. So I had written a previous book called The Thing with Feathers, which is about bird behavior and things that birds do and how they're kind of similar to people in different ways. And against all odds, that one became a bestseller. And it's now been translated into 13 different languages around the world. And it did Wonderful. really well. Then I turned around and I said, well, my dream has always been to do a worldwide big year. And I proposed to write a book about doing just that and sent it off to a publisher. And they agreed to send me an advance for the book up front. And I used that to fund the whole year. And then when I got done, then I had the next year to actually write the book that I'd promised. And that <laughs> called Birding Without Borders. And it's also done quite well. It, it was interesting to write it. It was like picking out the most amazing stories from the whole year and weaving them together into one narrative instead of just like one long list of bird names. <laughs> <laughs> With over 6,000. Yeah, that would have put a whole bunch of pages already. <laughs> That's fabulous. I mean, yeah. And, and now the rest of us can go and read your book and kind of go through some of these experiences. Like I want to read about the Harpy Eagle experience. That just sounds so cool to me. So now I want to ask, you've done the big year, you've had all this time going all around the world, is there something next on your list? Is there a bird you still haven't found yet, number 6,043, or <laughs> another one that's sort of mythological? Well, you know, after doing the big year and focusing on finding as many species as possible and traveling very quickly for a whole year, that was amazing. My worst fear is that I was going to get burned out and just like hate birds by the end of that. <laughs> right. Really, it was kind of hard to stop, honestly, at the end. But eventually I kind of stepped myself back down and wrote the book and and then it was on to the next project. And I really wanted to spend more time than just focusing on one bird rather than trying to see as many as possible. And that's one thing I really like about studying birds is that you have both these extremes. You can go look for some exotic bird in a foreign country that you've never seen before and add it to your life list. And that's very exciting. Or you can spend a lot of time looking at one very common bird, even in your own backyard and learn things about its behavior. And that to me is just as fascinating. So yeah. that's how I got into wow penguin counting project was I decided the next big project for me was going to be graduate school and going to get a master's degree studying chin strap penguins, which I just wrapped up last year. And now it's on to more future projects. I'm a full-time birder these days. I work as a guide for bird watching tours to Antarctica and the Arctic as well. And in my free time, I do writing projects. So I've written a couple of books for National Geographic now 
I'm working on one called Birding Basics, which is going to come out later this year in November. So if you're just getting started in bird watching, look out for that because it's a full length, full color guidebook to anyone who's just getting started and wants to know what to do and how to approach it. That's really exciting. And so you get to do a little bit of everything that but the most of all, it's everything that you love, right? That's the goal. That's what all of us dream about, right? Having that. I never so, thought again that birds would be like a career path. I just <laughs> always liked watching birds and studying them. And that's what I would do in my free time. And then people started yeah. for it in various ways. And so I feel very fortunate that I've been able to turn that into something that I love to do into a career that's taken me from one interesting project to the next. Yeah. And all over the world. So we're at that part in the show where we ask our experts for a challenge. And I'm very interested to hear what your challenge is for our listeners, Noah. My challenge to you is to go outside wherever you live and in your yard or your neighborhood around your house, find and identify 10 different species of birds. So that may be easier in some places than others. I think everyone should be able to get to 10 in their neighborhood at some point. Okay. If that's too easy, then I challenge you to do 25. Ooh. And if ah, nice. next to a wildlife refuge or something like that, then I challenge you to do 40. <laughs> <laughs> He's not letting anybody off the hook. And every bird counts. You can count an American crow. You can count a European starling. You can count a morning dove and a blue jay. Some people think, I don't know 10 kinds of birds, but once you start listing the birds that everyone knows, pigeons and eagles and hawks and falcons, et cetera, actually, you probably know more birds than you think. So yes. see if you take I a like walk, just identify 10 different kinds of birds during your walk. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, we actually have cardinals that live behind and I love seeing them fly back and forth. And on our walks, we haven't seen yet, but we hear owls hooting. My husband and I look as, you know, through that we have really tall trees here in Florida and, but it comes out about seven or eight o'clock at night, which it's kind of light here still, but you can hear it hooting. And we're just dying to have that owl fly out so we could go, there it is. <laughs> That's true. Birds you can hear also, they all make different noises. And actually it's like learning to speak a foreign language, almost learning bird noises. Wow days I can recognize just about any bird I hear around where I live by just the sound of their voice. Oh, that's so fun. Well, I, this has been a fabulous episode. Thank you so much for being on Solve It For Kids, Noah. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Wow, I really do love talking about animals on this show because I learned so much. I was never that much of an animal kid growing up, so I learned so much with these awesome guests. But having a biggest year in the world and searching for different species of birds every single day for 365 in a row, that just sounds cool, Jen. It does. And I mean, I just love that story about the harpy eagle. That is just so amazing. I mean, could you imagine? Agreed. You sit there and sit there and sit there and then it lands like right in front of you. <laughs> How yes. cool is that? Right? That is like a made-for-TV or made-for-movies moment. And apparently when you're out there following your passion and doing it long enough, some amazing things happen literally right in front of your face. Exactly. So what Noah has challenged all of us to do is get started on doing something like that by going outside and identifying 10 different species. I loved how he gave us a bigger number than just two or three or even five, <laughs> because anybody can just walk outside, see a couple of birds and be like, those are different, I'm going back in. <laughs> Finding 10 different species that you can identify is gonna take a little bit of time and effort. This is gonna be fun. It is, and this is the perfect time to do it because you can go out in the summer and sit in the backyard or your local park or whatever, and identify the birds. And sometimes they're not easy to see, by the way. So make sure you're looking really well. Absolutely. And then be sure to share your findings with us by tagging us on our social media. We are at KidSolve at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you could also leave us a comment on our website, which is solveitforkids.com on this episode page where again, I'm sure we will have lots of pictures of birds on that page. 
Excellent. And when you share any of that stuff about the birds that you're finding, I would love to know, include, if you were going to do a biggest year in the world, what would it be about? Very good. Until then, and until next time, you can catch us on Solve Solve It it for for Kids. Kids.